Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company. Welcome to Off the Clock, a series where I get to interview clock alums. Off the Clock, and indeed all of our programming, is only made possible through your generous support. So please, if you've been considering making a gift to Clock, but have put it off for one reason or another, I encourage you to make that donation today. Your support will ensure that Clock can continue to train the next generation of young artists and arts administrators. This episode, I got to catch up with Clock alumna, music director, and composer Georgia Stitt. Let's hear what she had to say. Georgia, I am so thrilled and happy to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks, Mark. I'm excited to be here. So uh, for our viewers, can you remind us, um, well, who you are, but also when you were at Clock? I, uh, my name is Georgia Stitt. I am a composer, lyricist, and also a music director um, of musical theater. I live in New York City and work in the Broadway, off-Broadway market. And um, I was at Clock. I was a rehearsal pianist in 1993. And then I was an associate conductor in 94. And then I was gone for a few years and I came back as a music director, like 97, 98, 99. Um, and then I came back as an audience member many, many years after that. Great. Um, do you have any, um, any favorite memories of when you were here at Clock? <sighs> The, uh, I mean, I really felt like it was my home. I felt like it was my special place. Uh, I still do. I still think of like, I have this little special spot on Cape Cod in West Falmouth where, um, where I know my way around and I still know a lot of people there. And uh, it feels, it, it, you know, whatever sacred means, it feels like a sacred place. And I think that's partly because of how many times I came back over the summer, over the summers and the relationships I met there, but also what it, uh, did for me as a young musician and the way it um, the way it launched me into the career that I wound up having. Um, so you, you asked specifically about favorite memories. Um, I mean, there are the, the work ones. I mean, I remember like specific moments of uh, like lessons that I learned, uh, like details about things from other conductors or from singers or uh, le learning how to coach. I uh, the first time I conducted an orchestra at all ever. Um, I mean, of course, you remember uh, standing there, at, like waiting to enter and then B. Haslin sending you in <laughs> to conduct your first matinee um, with his famous phrase that I guess I'm not allowed to repeat here. <laughs> I am allowed to repeat here. He would like right before you conduct, he would pat you on the back and say, don't fuck it up. And then you'd go do the show. <laughs> um, great. It's a life mantra there. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I I became very, very close with Dr. John and Avery Funkhauser, who live next door, lived next door to the property, um, and and continue to have a relationship with that family, with their children and who are my age. And uh, Avery died a few years ago. John is still there, and we're in close contact. So, like, I have second family in some ways there. Um, and then friends that I have from Clocker still active in my life but yeah memories of um specific shows and um and i remember late nights of prepping i remember learning um you know the the last minute things that the music department does to try to make the orchestration of the show match the instrumentation that you have in the pit and sort of learning there about um what how you can reorchestrate on the fly or like when you have parts that are written for read doublers but you don't have read doublers in the pit how you break things up and and redistribute them and and now that i work in on the other side of the industry which is creating the orchestrate creating the shows and the orchestrations for the first part sometimes i write something and i'm like oh somebody at clock is gonna be so mad at me <laughs> <laughs> someday when they're like why would you do it this way um, Do you have, um, was there anyone in particular that uh, you look back on as a mentor or someone who, who really Yeah, the, yeah, the, um, the, I think it was the first summer I was there, must have been the first summer, and the second summer, it was the same team, but the first summer I was there, John Morris Russell was a conductor, Eric Whitaker was the associate conductor, and I was a rehearsal pianist. Joe Oliferovich was the other associate, we called him Juice, and um, 
And that music team was like life changing to me. It was life changing. I mean, John Morris Russell was my conductor at college. That's why I went. I went to Vanderbilt. He was on staff at Vanderbilt, on faculty at Vanderbilt. And um, and he's the one that said to me, uh, they are looking for a rehearsal pianist at this Summerstock Theater where I work. You seem like you would be a good fit for that job. Would you be interested? And I applied and I got in and. Um, and so he already was, he was already the person who was teaching me conducting, but it was like we got to have another semester while, while he was there, just more intense time. And I got to see him working and I got to see him working with Eric. And then I remember lots of times when Eric and I would be doing the coachings together, I would be at the piano and he would be the associate doing coaching. And I learned a lot about how he thought, which was different than what I thought. Um, and I remember thinking, um, oh, there is, there is a there's a place for me in this industry. What I know and what people do fits. You know, this is it was the and I also remember um, that summer, you know, nine shows in eleven weeks, and I was at the piano for all of them, watching you know a jazz score go by, a Gilbert and Sullivan go by, an operetta go by, and they were all notated so differently. Um, and learning, like, what do the dancers need to hear? What do the singers need to hear? What is the conductor asking for? What is the director looking for? Like, learning how to synthesize all that information. Um, it's definitely something that happened in those ele those first 11 weeks. Uh, and then also beginning to see how composers solved problems. You know, when you sit there and play the same thing over and over and over and over again, you start to think, why is it like this? Or I, I started to think, why is it like this? Why is this here? What purpose does this music serve? Or, or you, but you, you're analyzing it as you're playing it. You recognize that, oh, this is a callback to that moment before, or this is an inversion of that moment before. And what is, dramaturgically, what is that saying? And it was when I began to think, oh, right, there are composers. I was already majoring in music composition, but I had assumed that I would be a classical composer because I don't think it ever dawned on me that you could be a musical theater composer. <laughs> People did that. All that but work think, that's available in classical composing. Well, say that again, what? You're, you're looking at all that available work in classical <laughs> I was like, am I, I'm gonna write string quartets for a living? That's what I'm gonna do? Sure. Not, not to disparage the people who do. <laughs> um, but, but it was, yeah, it was that summer that when I thought, oh, I, um, maybe, maybe I could do this. Somebody does this, maybe I could do this. I also think now about the female conductors that were always on staff there, you know, every summer there were many female conductors. Um, and when I got into uh, the New York world, there were fewer female conductors and I started to recognize how rare it was to have women at the head of the music department. And in a way, I, it felt strange to me because I had not experienced that. I had always, it, it just seemed like there was obviously a pathway because you know, I don't, I don't know the statistics. I was about to say fully half, but I don't, I don't know if it was that high. But I can think of many, many, many female conductors that I learned from in the years that I was there, or, um, or was colleagues with eventually, uh, and it never seemed strange to me. There were always women in the music department there. Uh, one thing you mentioned that I just want to ask if you can expound on a little bit was. Um, you were learning about what people need to hear. And just for uh, the audience that might not understand what you mean there, um, when you're playing a score as a rehearsal pianist, what does that mean that there are different things that you might change? Oh, that's great. That's fun to think about. Um, when you're playing rehearsal piano and you're the only musician in, or the only instrumentalist in the room with 32 singer, dancer, actors, and a conductor, um, you have to be thinking, especially with a very short process, which is what you have at clock, you, you have to think that the amount of time that they're going to have, they're going to hear the orchestra for one afternoon, and then they're going to do the show with the orchestra. So I need to be the translator to get them ready for what they're going to hear. Like, um, there are no drums, there are no strings, there are no uh, trumpets, there's, but what, what do they need to hear so that when they suddenly launch into the stage with an orchestra, they're not like, wait, what is that? Um, and, and then also because you're not working, at least when I was there, you're not working with any sort of microphones or any sort of amplification at all in the rehearsal space. Um, the way sound travels, you think if you're not really strong with where the beat is, the dancers can get confused and, and, you know, you lose the center of the sound. 
So things like um, being, especially in something like a Gilbert and Sullivan score, being really clear about where the beat is and where the bass line is, what they're going to hear. And, and if there is something like a lovely flute solo or a lovely oboe solo or a, a something, like making sure that you're, you're playing that, even if it means compromising something else, so that when they hear it, when they get to the zip probe, they're not, they're not like, oh, and they lose their place, <laughs> you know? Um, things like that. And then uh, for me, you play differently in a dance rehearsal than you play in a singer rehearsal because, of, uh, because for the most part, dancers, what they really need to hear is rhythm. And, and singers need to hear the musicality. They need to hear, they need to use that time to figure out where they can stretch or where they can't stretch or, you know, where, when you have to watch the conductor exactly, or when you're allowed to take your own time that you're figuring that out in rehearsal. And so the pianist's job is to facilitate all of that. Um, and sometimes in, in subtle nonverbal ways, just, you know, bringing something out or, or, avoiding something that you're like oh that's going to be a train wreck I just won't play it you know <laughs> yeah. as opposed to like trying to play every note on the page all the time at equal volume at equal intensity um, you're making decisions about how you can best represent the orchestra when the orchestra's not there yet I think that's uh one of the best if not the best explanation of it that I've, I've speaking as a non-musician um I mean I did play violin in high school so you're not a non I, not non but you know um, certainly a non-keyboardist. Uh, it's, 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 you said it was the translating what they're going to hear, which I think is so accurate. If anyone, anyone who's been in a rehearsal with music and a, and a, a pianist, and especially if they've been in like one that goes well and one that doesn't go, goes, doesn't go as well, so often it is a result of the translation not working. From, from yeah, I mean, I think at Clock is where I learned that your job is not to play every note on the page. You know, I, I the third show I did my first summer was The Merry Widow, um, an operetta. Uh, the well, I was handed, I remember what was on the piano was the full orchestra score. It wasn't a piano reduction. It was a full <laughs> orchestra score. And um, and I was like, oh, this feels like a final exam. <laughs> you know, what do I play? You don't have enough fingers or enough keys on the key. You, you can't possibly play everything that's in front of you. Um, and so your job is what do they need? What do they need to hear? And then, of course, when you're working at the full orchestra score, for those of you who don't know, not everything is written in the same key because they're all trans. They're all transposed for the instruments as the instruments need to play them. So you're doing math you're transposing and you're making judgment calls about what they need to hear um and i do remember sometimes john <laughs> morris russell saying i just need to hear dun 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 dun, 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 dun. that's all i need to hear i don't need everything i just need to you know yeah. but i think that's where i learned it probably trying to play too much of the filigree at the beginning and then and then i mean like that's all that's all noise we don't need any of that what we need is where's the beat um and then also even sometimes a jazzy score will have uh like everything everybody's doing written in counter counter melodies and everything and you're like i can't play all of that it's too confusing people will not know what to hear because in an orchestra you'll hear the saxophone line and you'll hear the trumpet line and you'll hear and when they're all on the piano it's all the same color and so it just sounds like dense chords you don't hear the lines moving um and so then you have to make a judgment call about what's most valuable what do you need to hear what, yeah. yeah yeah it's it's that art and science thing about what what's going to be what's going to be useful and also what's going to sound I mean, that's I'm always fascinated watching rehearsal pianists especially really good ones because you're you think wow like I I know what this sounds like because I've listened to the cast recording and so I know what the orchestra sounds like but they're playing exactly you know enough to, mm -hmm. to let me know exactly where where we are and you also mentioned that it's sort of like the oboe solo or something that happens that you might not necessarily think too much about, but from a director perspective, you, you know, the directors are always, I think, as speaking as a director, we're always listening to cast recordings and it's like those oboe solos and those things are like, oh, and then something really special happens because, you know, the orchestra drops out and it's just, and um, unless you have a really good rehearsal pianist, you don't get that feeling in the room of, oh, something special is happening. And right. then often you end up in, in sits probe or, or something and you're like, oh, this is a really special moment. I wish I knew that. <laughs> I wish I knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's, I talk all the time about musical dramaturgy, that the job of a composer and the job of an orchestrator is to tell the story with the instruments that you have in front of you, whether that's the voices or the, um, or the pit musicians. But those sorts of surprises um, or an orchestrator's dream. An orchestrator made that choice, said, oh, there's, there's something interesting happening dramaturgically here. If like somebody exits the stage and somebody lingers because that person is gone. So you, the music is reflecting that feeling. Um, I mean, anytime, anytime you have good work, anytime you have a good composer and good orchestrator, that is all, that's all been chosen deliberately. And yeah. yeah. This might be a bit of a tangent question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, okay. um, because I want to. Uh, I spent most of my career in Germany in opera houses, and um, there is often a tendency, not just German directors, but especially I think with German directors, to kind of um, stage in opposition of certain things. So like you mentioned, you know, there's this oboe line, which is clearly like the count leaves to go wherever. And um, the director's like, no, no, but the count doesn't leave. The count, you know, sits on the sofa, whatever. And um, I'm just, this is just a question of, do you, when, when you see a production of something, especially things that have been done a lot, you know, and you know the score, does that, um, does that rile you, get your hackles up, or, or are you okay with that? I mean, I think, anything that draws attention to the artist instead of the work is distracting. So if that happens and it makes me think, oh, this is a director trying to be clever, then it's annoying to me. Um, the first thing that I'll think, if I really know it well enough to notice that, the first thing that I'll think is why? Why did the director make that choice? What is the director trying to tell me? And then if I don't it, you know, if it illuminates something and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a comment on, then I think it's brilliant. Yeah, sometimes, um, sometimes it, it works, yeah. Yeah, but if it's like, oh, that's just a director trying to say, I know everyone does it this way and I'm not going to do it that way, then I get annoyed. And I feel that way about lyricists too. When the lyrics get really clever and I start thinking about the craft of the lyricist instead of what the character is going through, I get really annoyed there too. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's sort of where I'm at with it too. I think... I certainly, often people will change things and it will, and it will be amazing. It'll be like, wow, that makes, that just changed the whole way I think about this scene or this character. And that's really interesting. But that more often I think than not, I'm like, okay, you're just doing this because you didn't want to do it the way everyone's, you know, it's traviata and you feel like you need to do it differently. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably different with something that is is that much in the repertoire and is done so frequently that you have to figure out, you know, it's like Shakespeare. You have to figure out how to put your stamp on it so that your production is different from the 18 other productions that happened that season, you know, mm -hmm. I guess. But but I think of the part of me that's a writer, like the, the Dramatist Guild, uh, we've been having this conversation. I'm in, I'm in the council and leadership of the Dramatist Guild. And uh, one of the conversations we've been having lately is about stage directions, that stage directions are actually copyrightable, that, that stage directions are part of the copyright of the show. Mm -hmm. And the, the nuance of the conversation is if, you know, for sure, if you say like, the sky cracks open and it begins to rain, and a director says, I don't think it should rain, then you're not really doing the show that the author wrote. And that feels pretty black and white to me. But the the nuance is if you say he exits left and the director says, I want him to exit right. Um, the drama skilled says he's supposed to exit left. <laughs> Your job as a director is to fill in the spaces around what's on the page, not to change what's on the page. You don't actually have the right to change what's on the page. And, and I sit there in those meetings and I think that is true in theory and I don't, know how you enforce that in practice. That is not common practice. But then as a person who writes, I think, what if I have made a choice that this character always exits left and that means something. And, that means something. and then you bl you decide not to uphold that and all of that meaning goes away because you didn't get it. It's, it's tricky, it's nuanced. So, so for me, I think it's always about what is the author's intention and what is what is the best storytelling and anything that draws you to like this is somebody being clever or someone trying to put a spotlight on his or her own work is um that's why it's annoying to me it's that, that, that example is just 
I'm going to probably think about this while I'm trying to fall asleep tonight. It's fascinating because it's also, you know, left and right is relative. And um, obviously we in America think of it as obviously it's stage left, but in Europe, it's always audience perspective. So it's audience. Oh. So like if a European is reading a translation of it, that's all turned around anyway. And um, it's, that's, I, yeah, not for now, but that's a great conversation to keep having. Yeah. Um, so Georgia, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your career now. Um, catch us up with what you've been doing and all the exciting stuff going on. Uh, okay, well, I, I tend to divide my work between music directing work and composer lyricist writing work sometimes orchestrator, but I would say that's lower on the list. That's that when that happens, it's great, but I've really only ever orchestrated my own work. I, I would not hang out my shingle as a person who orchestrates other people's shows. Um, but I do music direct other people's shows. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's a hard question to answer now in COVID times because <laughs> what I do now is I have zoom calls, but, um, in the before times, uh, the I the last show, last run of a show that I music directed was Sweet Charity off Broadway with Sutton Foster and Lee Silverman was a director, um, and that was in 2017, um, 2016 into 2017. And then um, I, I've been writing. I released an album of theatrical songs in May. I just I am writing a show with Hunter Foster right now. It's funny that I'm working with Hunter and Sutton, but uh, they're brother and sister. But uh, Hunter Foster and I are writing a show together. We just did a reading, a Zoom reading a couple weeks ago um, that it, our, our musical is about um, uh, a, a man, the patriarch of a family who believes that the world is going to end like on a certain day at a certain time because his preacher told him so. And his three adult children who all have different political views and different religious views and sort of what it does to a family um, when someone makes a radical choice because they believe something and how you support someone when you don't agree with what they believe in, which feels very timely because <laughs> that's what we're all in this country divided about right now. Um, and then I, um, I'm writing uh, uh, the the next album that I'm making is a collection of art songs because I I, grew, I was a classical musician first as I as I guess I said when I came to Clock I was thinking that I was going to be a string quartet symphony classical composer. Um, but there's a part of me that still very much likes writing uh, contemporary classical music. So I write choral music and I write art songs. And so the next album that I'm working on is is art songs, poetry settings um, for singers and voice and small instrumentation. I mean, piano and small instrumentations. Um, and I got about a third, maybe a half of that album recorded before we went into quarantine and everything shut down. So I'm waiting for recording studios to open back up and for me to have a plan where we can do such an intimate recording in um, in a safe space. Um, I'm writing an oratorio. Those are the big writing projects. And then, um, honestly, a lot of my time right now... Oh, and I also play for... Um, Kate Baldwin is a Broadway performer, and she does concerts around the country. Uh, not so much right now, but uh, a few right now. And I'm her music director and pianist, so I play for her, which is wonderful. She's also a very close friend. Um, but a lot of what I'm doing right now is I started in a not-for-profit in the, uh, in the wake of the Sweet Charity experience. Sweet Charity was a wonderful show. Um, Lee Silverman approached it from a feminist point of view, and she said, I want to think about charity as, um, as operating differently in the world than she operates when she's in her own dressing room when she's in her own safe space and in the dressing room she's only surrounded by women and when she's out in the world she interacts with women and men and her relationships with men are the anchors of the piece so I want to think about the piece through a gender lens and since a lot of charity songs happen in the dressing room I want the band who's going to be visible on stage to be all women because that's her safe space and there should be only women and you're going to be in costume and so you'll be a uh, part of her safe space and I had never had a director talk to me about hiring of musicians with dramaturgical purpose. Like, I, I just thought it was fascinating that we were going to be part of the story in that way. Um, so then hiring those musicians turned out to be really hard. For hiring, um, finding the rhythm section players, especially the drummer, the bass player, the rhythm guitar player, um, 
because Lee wanted them all to be female identifying and not all to be white. There was, she said, I just wanted to feel like a cross section of what a city, you know, looks like. Uh, and so it was really hard to find those women. And um, by the end of the process, when we finally did have the women, I had this enormous spreadsheet of women who had said, oh, I'd love to do this, but I'm not available or it's not enough money or whatever the reason was. Um, and, and I became the go-to person for people who were like, oh, I need a female bass player too. Who is it? And you had the spreadsheet. I had the spreadsheet. Yeah. And, um, and then I also had a Facebook, a really, you know how sometimes you get a really active Facebook conversation where like, hey, who are the female music directors and associates? And it, so then I had that list too. And so I hired a web designer and built a database. And, um, and, and the women, we started meeting the composers, especially the women composers started meeting regularly. And, uh, it, at first, I was just like, I'm just going to build a website and give it to the world. That's that's my, because it shouldn't be a spreadsheet. And I don't want to be an agent. I don't want to be the like, oh, hire this person. And this person's a better player than that person. I don't want to do that. Um, but eventually, that became um, a not-for-profit organization. We, have, we got our not-for-profit status in 2019. The organization's called Maestra, because when you type Maestra, which is the feminine version of Maestro, when you type Maestra into the computer, it autocorrects to Maestro. It doesn't recognize that that's a thing. And I thought that was very <laughs> appropriate. Um, and and Maestra has grown. It now Our database is enormous. If you're looking for, we say, female, uh, non-binary, gender non-conforming musicians in the field, um, you can go to maestromusic.org and, and search for those people. There are all sorts of search filters. Like if you're looking for a composer, you're looking for a conductor who is also a piano conductor or a baton conductor, or you're looking for someone who plays guitar and bass. And then you can search by region across, I used to say around the country, but now we have lots of users in, um, in the UK and Australia as well, and starting to be other, other locations too. Um, you can look for sound designers. You can look for someone who uses Ableton. You can use someone who's a home studio whiz, you know, so it's the search filters and, and you can search for people of color, which we're getting a lot of use for now when people are saying, uh, just starting to acknowledge the, the traditional history of hiring all white people and how problematic that is. So um, being able to search for musicians of color is, is a huge asset too for this uh, website. Um, so all of that exists and the not-for-profit has been around for a year and now, you know, it, Anytime you start a not-for-profit, it explodes. Now we have programming, and we have staff, and we have um, master classes. We have online technical workshops, and we have um, special events, and and uh, we have a book club. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we're doing to uh, to try to we say give support, visibility, and community to the women who make the music in the musical theater industry. I can't believe how how much it's it's grown just from because I remember visiting the site. Um, I guess it must have been two years ago, and then going back, and it's, and this was going to be a question, you sort of answered it already, but um, it seems to have kind of grown into something that I don't think you expected it to become, is that correct? At the beginning, I mean, I really did think I was, um, I was building a database, and then thinking, like, who's going to house this database? Where should it live? Like, should it be at the Dramatist Guild? And what's interesting is that so many of us, and I don't think this is just women, I think this is people who do this for a living, um, are both composers and music directors. Like, those of us who grow exactly what my trajectory was, was I played the piano because I got paid to do it, and that the, the latter led me to conducting, which I had studied in school, but because I could play, I got in the room where I saw how the latter worked. Um, all of that led to how I paid my bills for a decade in New York, but I was always writing on the side. I was a, my major was music composition and I had wanted to be a writer, but nobody will hire, I mean, very few people will hire a 22 year old woman composer with no experience to write the next show. So you have to spend years, I had to spend years um, becoming known, you know, becoming known as a, as a, musical expert as someone who could be trusted with a music department. And, um, and then that shifted into people being interested in what I was writing. Um, and, and so anyway, all that is just to say like, what I would think is so interesting about this network that we built is that it's not really necessarily just a dramatist guild sort of thing, nor is it a musician's union sort of thing, because so many of us live in these, uh, in these combined spaces. 
Yeah, you sort of um, touched on my next question a little bit, which is um, getting work in your field and, and how that works and what that looks like. I think that would be interesting, interesting for folks to see, um, A, how many projects are you working on normally at one time? And where does your next project normally come from? Um, and I think, I think you've also sort of hit on that with the clear need for something like Maestra touches on, on a lot of that, of how work is, is exchanged. But can you talk a little bit about that and how, how many projects and how you move on to your next project? Um, well, then, music directing is um, is a little bit more finite because things go into production and you have dates. You know, you'll be hired starting this date, and then the show closes on this date. And and that, I mean, every now and then you get attached to something that's an open ended run, but usually things are finite. Um, and so then then you build a schedule for your life uh, around around, you know, not things not overlapping. You can't be in a 10 to six rehearsal in two places at the same time. Some some people are lucky enough that they're supervising something and conducting something else and they are, uh, you know, they are spread out that way. But really you can only be in one room physically at a time. Um, and I, the, the writing stuff is, never ends and, and never starts. I mean, somebody says, I have an idea for a musical and 12 years later, you're still working on it. <laughs> um, I think with with the writing, there is, uh, I'm constantly looking. Everything I read, everything I read, I think, is this a musical? Every story I hear on the news, I think, is this a musical? Um, why would it be a musical? what's musical about it, what purpose is there for music to be in it. And then if I were working on this musical, who would I want to work with? Like who would my team be? Who like who would my collaborators be? Who would direct it? Who would I write it for? Like some con that's that's ever present in my brain. And when something gets stuck in there and you keep coming back to it and thinking about it, that's when I call my agent and I'm like, I have an idea. I think this is a thing. Or maybe I don't call the agent yet and I call the potential collaborator and I say, I think this is a thing Sometimes people come to me with that, and I do get uh, a lot of submissions. You know, people will send me a script and say, I'm, we are looking for a composer. Does this interest you? And when that happens, uh, I, I think a lot of things. I think um, this, this story and this, this world that we'll be working on for this show has to hold my attention for a decade. Like, this has to be something that I'd be willing to work on for 10 years, not just like, oh, this would be fun for the summer. But this, like, I have to be invested in these characters. Am I interested enough in this topic that this becomes, like, a chapter in the book of my life? <laughs> this is, you know, that was the, the decade that I wrote about the end of the world or, uh, or whatever it was. Um, because they really do take forever and, the, um, and the, the journeys are long and the people that you wind up collaborating with are, you know, you're sending Christmas cards to them over and over and over. <laughs> they are your people. Um, and, and so I, I, I think that, uh, and oftentimes then you also think now, now that I'm as old as I am, you think, uh, is this something that could actually happen? Cause I've had enough projects that you write and they never get produced or you're, you're in the middle of writing them and the collaboration falls apart. Or, uh, I certainly have one piece that I was writing and the world changed enough that I don't think it's a viable piece of theater anymore. I don't who would produce that anymore? You know, it, it's, uh, it's challenging in a way that it wasn't a decade ago. And that, you know, so you go. So I think all of those questions are, um, are how, how you decide to work on. And then, um, then for me, there's just a, every day I look at like what hours are available to me to write and which deadline is the closest and what do I need to work on today in order to not get behind. So you mentioned, uh, I think that's, I don't know, it shouldn't be surprising, but it, I think it's surprising for a lot of people when they think, oh, project, I'm going to commit a decade of my life. And it makes a lot of sense why you would put so much, um, you know, scrutiny into choosing the project. And you mentioned, obviously, projects that, that never come to be. And as a composer, do you, what, that, that material does, you know, do you end up with trunk songs, like the old fashioned trunk oh songs? Maybe I can pull this out later? Or are you like, nope, that's dead to me and I need to start fresh? Or what do you do with the... Well, with the I have four albums. <laughs> and those are songs that that didn't 
you know, that didn't wind up somewhere else. In many cases, there's songs that I wrote uh, for something that never happened um, or songs that I wrote for standalone reasons. Um, I I have always thought that there will be a moment in a show where I can pull out ye old chunk song and, and stick it in right here. It'll be great. And I, I have not once, not never had that be effective. <laughs> in fact, um, I have... I have taken my trunk songs. Lots of people have said, what if we make a review out of your songs from your albums? Um, and I have with four different collaborators tried to do that. And at a certain point, I find myself rewriting the trunk song, like take the trunk song and, and then ultimately throwing the trunk song out and saying, what we really need is a song that does this. And so then I write that song um, and then that becomes a trunk song. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's really hard because of the musical dramaturgy part of it, because you, because I am not, uh, I'm not known for just writing standards. Like I'm not, the songs that I write would not have been on an Ella Fitzgerald album. Um, they're, they're wordy and they're dense and they're problem solving and they, um, and they're emotional. And, and I really have spent a lot of time trying to think, the challenge is to write something that serves the story that gets your character from point A to point B and serves the story, but isn't so plot specific that, that it can also exist out of the story. Um, and I think when you do that, it, it, it's, it's so thrilling when you write something that feels like, Oh, this, this could be a hit or, or someone might sing this and not ever have seen the play. And it doesn't matter um, because the song is, 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 uh, self-sufficient enough that it can live on its own. Um, but yeah. but yeah. I was just gonna say, but most of the time the music is connected to that. And so, um, and so the music is telling a, a part of the story that is, is hard to pull out of the show. Right. I think that speaks a lot to um, the nature of musical or music theater, just like at the core, you know, when musical theater 101, you're in the class and it's like, okay, it's a play and then something becomes too heightened or too important that it needs the support of, of music and, and then the, the actor sings. And often those are moments that take on sort of a, although plot specific, there's a universality about them. And I think you're right, like that's that sweet golden, you know, the grail of song. It's like, yes, it's, it's absolutely perfect for this moment of theater, but it's also perfect on a different level where, because it says something about the human experience. Or, um, yeah. Do you, do you prefer to, to write your own lyrics or do you work with a lyricist? I have gotten to where I prefer to write my own lyrics. I, um, I have several lyricists that I write with and I, uh, I think my standards have gotten higher and higher over the years that now I'm like, if I feel like you um, have something to say about this that's different, your perspective is going to be different from mine or um, yeah, your worldview or your life experience is going to be different than for, by all means, let's collaborate on this. But if it's just about technique, just let me do it. Also, when I write lyrics, I'm often also writing the music at the same time, like the, the rhythm of the words and the way they land on phrases. And uh, if, if, a, if a phrase commands a long note, you can feel, so I'm, I'm doing that music work while I'm writing the lyrics. So uh, by, the time, by the time I have the grid of lyrics, I already sort of know loosely what the melody is. I may not have put my hands on the piano to figure it out harmonically yet, but I, I have a sense of like what the meter is and whether it's fast or slow and whether it's major or minor and whether, you know, like where the transitions are and where the long notes are and things like that. Um, and so if I'm, if I'm collaborating with someone else, I think there's, there's just translation time where you say, did you mean for this to do, do you want me to, you know, and, and, so it's nice not to have to have that stuff. <laughs> right. Unless it's someone that I just think is genius and I'm, and I'm there to learn, you know, some, or someone who's, who's bringing something to it that's not what I would have thought, which sometimes is extremely valuable. Right. Uh, so next question, again, about your field is, is, what is it that you absolutely love about what you do? And um, what's something you would change about your field if you could? I'll start with the change. I think um, the, I mean, there's my, the way that I work goes in, um, in phases. So there are times when I'm just at home writing and then there are times when I'm in production and I go to a rehearsal space and I'm there or to a theater and I'm there all the time. Um, and I think uh, 
in the years when I had babies, when I had small children, I, it was really hard for me to figure out how to be the person who went to this space, you know, and, um, even Sweet Charity that I did recently, I, I had not music directed a run of a show for a long time. And then I came back and worked on that show and I thought, oh, I leave the house at six o'clock every night and I'm gone all day Saturday and all day Sunday. So my work happens when my kids are not at school. So I never see my children. Um, and I, I think that is connected to the idea that theater is entertainment and, and we have to do theater in the evenings and on the weekends when people aren't at their jobs. I, I mean, obviously that's, you can't have a show at three o'clock in the afternoon when everyone's at work. Um, but, but there's something about the way that we're asked to, the, the way that we're asked to sacrifice our families in order to do the job that we do that feels difficult. The movie industry doesn't do that. Uh, the corporate world doesn't do that. And, and so this, and uh, certainly when you're in tech rehearsals and all, like, there just are chunks of time where you're like, I'm never gonna see my husband. I'm never gonna see my children. And, um, and it became prohibitive. I mean, certainly during the run of Sweet Charity, I thought, I'm, I don't, I don't want to miss my children's life. I don't want to miss every event that they have and never, and birthday parties and, uh, and and the fact that we're being asked to choose between making theater and being part of a family feels too hard. So I'm hoping that that's a conversation that people are revisiting in this pandemic time is uh, certainly I'm seeing lots and lots of stories of people who are saying I have never in my life gotten to spend a summer with my family. You know, like I, I was with my kids at the beach. I never get to do that. Not to say like we should all just go to the beach and we should never work, but I wonder if there is a way to think about wellness and what it means to have the support of your family to be present with your family in order to be able to do your good work that we're missing by the way we make theater. So that's my complaint. Um, and then what I love the most is collaborating. I mean, what I love the most is, uh, is like literally the one-on-one -on -one music making. Um, Kate Baldwin and I just did a concert recently. We did this socially distanced outdoors concert, which people are doing more and more of now, where the audience had white circles drawn on the grass and they bought pods and they could sit in the pod. And we, you know, were on stage. I wore a mask on stage while I played the piano. Um, but I, after having not done it for a long time, uh, we, Kate and I have done the same rep over and over again. And so we sat down to start doing the, the, practicing the music and it was in my fingers and it was in her voice and we just did it and we both kind of were overwhelmed with emotion like I'm actually an expert at something that I'm not allowed to do right now but this thing where I know where you're going to breathe and I can tell if you're going to linger and I and I know if you need me to stretch something because we've done it so much that I am in your head and you're communicating to me um I just think that is my favorite part of, of this. What, whether it is, is with singer and pianist, that relationship, or whether I'm thinking about it as a composer, like what is the singer gonna need? Are these, where is the singer gonna need to take a breath? Where is the singer gonna need to regroup? Where is, where is it emotionally gonna be challenging? Where should the high note be? Like that kind of imaginary collaboration is, um, it's, it's all about the connection of people, which I think is why it's so hard right now, because we're, because we're not, that's the part that we can't do. So you, you mentioned it a little bit, but um, I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit about, on how COVID's affected you um, and uh, not asking you to make any predictions, but um, where you think we're heading and, and also if you think it, the industry is going to be different when we, when we get out of this. Um, I think the industry is going to be different when we get out of this. Uh, you might have to repeat all the other questions because that's the one that <laughs> stuck in my head. Start there. Start there. I mean, I think um, I heard someone say we were having two simultaneous pandemics, and then I heard someone say we we're having three simultaneous. So we're having obviously the COVID pandemic, and then we're having a, a racial justice awakening pandemic, um, and perhaps we're also having a climate change pandemic. Um, I don't know if that language is right, but basically we're in, we're in triple crisis, I feel like uh, right now. Um, and the COVID part, I feel, um, 
I feel like there, there were several months of the whole world saying the safest thing you can do is go home and not come out of your house. Just stay home. Don't do, don't do anything. Stay home. Um, and so then the idea that we are now being sort of encouraged to go back into our lives doesn't, we haven't been re reassured that it's safe yet. Um, whether you are a, a hardcore, I always wear a mask or <laughs> one of those people who believes the other thing, um, then you, then still it does there's not a sense of like whoo we're out of the woods it's safe now and so how long it's going to take for um for people to feel like they can sit in an audience next to someone else who's coughing i think that's that's a hard thing i can't be a fortune teller there um it still feels like a, a long way away and for those of us who make our living doing that i it's unsustainable like no income is unsustainable and so i i see people at the top of their game, like really, really expert A-list people leaving the business, um, saying, can't do this anymore, going back to school, moving to another town, buying a house, I'm, you know, ha having a baby, like the things that you do when you're, when you see the gap in your life uh, or the space open up for you to regroup. And so I think, all right, when the industry does come back, those people aren't in it anymore. So that is, that, that's different um, immediately. And then I think the racial justice part is so significant. I think uh, there has been such a call to action of, um, of the way business as usual has been. It, it cannot go back to that. I think there are certain shows that um, it will be questionable whether you can do them anymore because they required um, a disconnect from, from what, what we now recognize as truth. Um, and there's been uh, a long overdue awakening uh, um, among the storytellers and the audience members and then and the people who are in the gatekeepers, the people who are in positions to hire. Um, so my hope in how the industry changes is that certainly I, I've been saying since Maestro was founded that our part of our mission statement from the beginning has been uh, to reevaluate who gets invited to sit at the table, you know, like if, if the table of where the decisions are made. Um, and so I think we have to be uh, inclusive and intersectional at, as we think at every level who's invited to the table, who's invited who, to be a theater maker, who's invited to be um, in positions of power and decision making and how does that change the industry all the way down. I think that's enormously crucial and if the industry doesn't change as a result of that, I'm not sure I have a place in it anymore. Um, so it has to change. So. Um, when you fuse those things together, what does the industry look like? I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> but I but I hope that there's a place for me in it. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, it's certainly going to be interesting to see what we what we end up with on the other side. And and I think your point about those who have left the industry is a very powerful one because it's you know that's a drain a talent drain that you can't recoup, at least not in our generation, you know, there's going to be a gap there. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that gap is, is filled. And, um, and the younger people who don't think it's a viable career path, because they, you know, they don't see sustainability there. And I think what's really so hard to process about all of it is how, how much we are consuming the arts right now, when you think about how we're using our time in quarantine. We're watching things on TV and we're watching movies. We're streaming things. We're streaming music. We're reading books. Uh, and that those were all things that were generated by artists who had to have the ability to nurture their craft. And I'll bring it back to at, like at some place like clock where you learn, where you learn how to do what you want to do with your life. Um, and, and I think for the young people who don't see the roads into a career path or uh, how you make a living doing that, there's going to be a dearth there. Um, and then, like I said before, the, the sustainability of people who do do it or the lack of value of something that people do consume, um, but they think of it as frivolous as opposed to lifeblood. That's, you know, art versus commerce. That's since the beginning of time. Right. Yeah. It's an old conversation, but just a new a new lens on it. Mm -hmm. um, Georgia, it's been so wonderful, lovely chatting with you. I have one last question before, okay. before we, we close up, and that is, if you had a piece of advice for your 20-year-old self, 
um, maybe while you were here playing the piano clock, what would that be? <laughs> um, I mean, I think the, the responsible professional advice would be uh, to, to I, I was gonna say to write more, to be more disciplined about writing instead of thinking that there will be time to do it later, like do it now. I think that my life advice always is if, if you want to do something, do it now because then the time just goes and eventually you're old and you miss the opportunity um, to do it now. Uh, but I also think there's a, that that pertains to like the fun stuff too. The, the clock was like, the, the socializing and the, the relationships and the people I met. I, I don't know if it's advice for younger me or if it's advice for younger people now, but truly the relationships I made with the people in those years are still some of my closest friendships and some of my um, strongest professional alliances. And so I guess the advice is like treat every relationship as if it's, if it, as if it's going to be lifelong because it might be. That's great. That's awesome. Okay, good. I got to that eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for watching this episode of Off the Clock. Check our website for a list of upcoming events, including our October 17th costume sale here at our West Falmouth campus and an upcoming Clock Tales concert with Broadway's Haley Swindle. I hope to see you all there. Thank you.